Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm not your host, Josh Lindsay, but I am the documentary filmmaker, Christian Taylor. And I'm here today not with Josh Lindsay or Jason Rugg. I'm here with our writer, Zach Callahan. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, just uh, things from a writer's perspective who's joined our crew. And uh, we're going to hear about Zach's uh, sort of history and what he's been doing for us at Documentary First, and and more importantly, what's just happened over the last month uh, in his life um, as he has kind of been part of our team. So, Zach, hi there, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, hey, Christian, it's great to be back on the podcast again. Yeah, you have been here before, and so if you're interested in hearing more from Zach, you can look back at our past um, episodes. But Zach, I want to talk as if we've never had you on the podcast before. So um, you are now a sort of a staff writer here at Documentary First. Uh, talk a little bit about what your um, background is in terms of how you got into script writing and how you ended up with Documentary First and what you've been doing. Yeah, so I uh, graduated from college uh, about two and a half years ago now from uh, Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. Went to school for film uh, with a bit of a focus on screenwriting. That's what I was uh, most interested in and most passionate uh, about uh, at the time and still now. And so I think about six months after I graduated, I got in touch with you through a, a friend. And yeah, it kind of just started off with you giving me little projects here and there. Uh, kind of testing me to see, you know, uh, what what my abilities were and my interest in the projects and stuff like that. So I've done everything from, you know, the newsletter to editing YouTube videos and everything in between. And then slowly but surely, you started bringing me uh, little projects and start, started to, you know, see what I was interested in. And yeah, it ended up going all the way through going to Normandy together and uh, shooting on a shooting on a project that I was able to, you know, do the writing, the uh, pre-production for. And yeah, it's, it's been quite the journey. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, um, your perspective of kind of what's been happening over the last, I mean, have you been around 18 months? Is that about what it is? Yeah, yeah it's about, yeah. Um, you know, because you're right. You came on board, you were interested in helping. I don't really know you, don't know what your skills are. You are right out of college. And as a director, I am testing who you are and the metal you're made of and what your capabilities and skills are. And more importantly, where your interests lie because you wanted to do, you know, narrative script writing, you still do. And, you know, I was, you know, wondering, would you even be interested in trying documentary work? And so I, you know, you're right. I gave you some little tasks, tasks that we needed done, like newsletter stuff, or you even did some editing at one point. You've done assistant work at some point. You've been willing to do whatever we needed to do you to do whenever we asked you, which a is an amazing quality uh, for somebody that's really interested in, you know, doing a specific thing in the industry. I think being willing to do anything in order to find the path to what you really want to do is important with people watching. So yes, I was watching you. I saw your willingness to to do whatever we asked and you did it well. And so then I started giving you a little more uh, responsibility and kind of bringing you in and you did an amazing job there. The first project I put you on was uh, The Brave Dutch. And I watched as you kind of really dug into that story and spent your a lot of time on your own, not being paid, um, really trying to to figure this out. And as you just, I mean, you did you did an amazing job in you know doing so much research on that story. Uh, when the Carenton project came up, I was. I was like, are you sure you're interested in, you know, kind of World War II doc stuff or, and by that time, what'd you tell me? Well, yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I had become kind of, I, cause I wasn't originally, I mean, I've always been interested in World War II to a certain level, but it wasn't something that I would say I was, you know, passionate about, or was like, I want to work on World War II documentary, but the Brave Dutch was kind of, you know, that's what it kind of hooked me. And, and so I became super fascinated in that story. And then when you brought up the, the Carenton uh, project, I was like, oh, look, I'm already invested in all this now. And like, I'm obsessed with this world. I was just telling you 
you know, before we started the uh, the podcast for it, I'm like listening to like three World War II uh, audio books now and all that stuff. Like once you get the itch, you know, I, you, you get it. You can't get rid of it. So It is so true. It is so true. Um, I was reading today, uh, you know, in, in preparation for our DocuView Deja Vu segment, I was reading about the movie I'm going to talk about. And the director quoted a saying from Martin Scorsese that says, your job as a director is to make other people um, interested in what you're obsessed about. And I thought that is so incredibly true because when you are passionate about something and you find it so interesting, uh, you want to share that with others and get them interested too. And I have watched that happen with you and um, it's just it's just been amazing. And I have to say um, what you've done in the Carenton doc has even just impressed me all the more because you started from scratch with that. And it is a very complicated story, very complicated, intricate, not clear cut. The battle is challenging to learn and understand. Um, but you really applied yourself to that. Um, talk about, let's talk about what you did in preparation for um, what we just shot in Normandy. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a long process and it was definitely, you know, I wasn't very familiar with it. I had seen Band of Brothers and knew the episode and had knew the town because of that. But besides that, I really didn't know that much about it. And so I just, you know, kind of started from scratch, researching, reading whatever I could find, watching, you know, dumbing it down to the smallest level, watching YouTube videos. It's like, please explain this in layman's terms uh, and get just trying to familiarize myself with the names and the locations. And still, even after, you know, all of the reading and all the maps, I was at everything, you really, it's hard until you get there to truly comprehend and understand it. But because I had done so much research when I did get there, I was like, oh my God, I know exactly what that is and who was here and all that stuff, which made that uh, a great experience. But not to get too far ahead, you know, I, I spent a lot of time just also talking to the great, you know, connections that we've made, or that you've made, that you've introduced me to. Denis Vandenberg was a huge help. Anytime I had a question about anything, message him. I would ask him, you know, one little question and he would send me back three paragraphs. And I, his book was like my... I got it sitting right here next to me. This was like my Bible for all, yeah. everything crash course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I use that for everything. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it was just kind of, go ahead. Let me just give a little bit of our audience, let them know who Denis Vandenbrink is. Oh, so yeah, of course. He, he is a, his, he, he won't call himself a historian. I believe he's a historian. Um, he will say he's a historical consultant, um, but he is just um, obsessed with the 101st Airborne Division, specifically uh, around the town of Carentan. And he's a big supporter of the town and helping to make this battle known. And he is also an author. He's written a whole bunch of books about the 101st. And so he definitely is an expert in the Battle of Carentan and uh, the, you know, the 101st Airborne specifically. So, And he's a producer on this project. So uh, he really has been our go-to guy for information. Yeah, yeah. He was a huge amount of help and just diving into the characters and the location and the process of the battle and trying to understand the mindset of the soldiers, the mindset of the civilians, the mindset of the Germans that were occupying, you know, it's all all that kind of goes into the process. And then I my first step was just kind of try to build an outline. And originally we had uh thought of it as a series, you know, like a docu series going through episode and episode. And we were going to kind of focus on the characters and have them lead each episode, which I still think, it, you know, was a good idea, but I don't think it was ultimately uh, the best project for us, the best way to tell the yeah. story. Yeah, just um, let me interject there. The reason for that was because it, it's really a practical one and it's a business decision, really. it's. I still think it works as a doc series. I think it should be a doc series for all the information that we have. But when we pitched the Brave Dutch to all the streaming services and trying to find upfront money to make it, um, we were told that they re weren't going to you know, advance money to make a doc series. And so in light of that news, I thought, okay, um, we need to figure out how, if we're going to tell the story, you know, we need to figure out how to tell it. And so, and we need to figure out um, what will people buy, you know? Uh, and so that decision of going back to a documentary was based on that 
business decision of, um, you know, I don't know that we could get a doc series sold at this time. So um, we're back to this idea of making a documentary. And I gave you the challenge then of switching gears, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we decided to go feature length and we were just trying to kind of find the story and find a different way to tell it. And I think it just, we were on a you know, call similar to this and it kind of just, we were like, the town itself is really, you know, the key figure and it's been through so much. And that's where we kind of decided to center our focus around it. And so then we started working on the outline and I wrote, you know, just kind of intertwining the battle with, you know, the stories that the civilians had um, about what it was like when it was occupied, before it was occupied, after the current state, um, now that it's, you know, a thriving city after everything that it had been through. And we kind of came up with that. Then we picked out who we were going to be interviewing um, with your connections. And I just started writing, you know, the, coming up with a whole pool of questions and then breaking those apart for it would be best for this person to ask this question and kind of just came up with about 25-ish questions per interviewee and that was the main prep work I would say we kind of worked together uh, with a few other uh, people over in Normandy to pick out which scenes we thought the best for recreation um, with the reenactors and that was most of the prep work I did. It was just, you know, having a good understanding, being prepared to ask the right questions so we would have the right answers for post-production. And then picking out, you know, we only had a limited time, limited amount of funds, so making sure we were making the right decision on what scenes to reenact and we weren't wasting money or time in that regard. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great way to put it. We really, um, and again, for people that may be new listening to this, um, we decided when, when we were pitching the Brave Dutch, uh, the first thing that Disney asked us, they were interested, but they said, where's your sizzle reel? And we didn't have a sizzle reel for the Brave Dutch. So I kind of, I knew we were already going to be in Normandy. I knew we were going to need a sizzle reel if we were going to pitch this in any way. So I said, okay, well, let's take four days. Let's shoot enough to get sizzle reel material, come back, put it all together, and then we'll try to raise money, um, you know, to do this as a doc. And so you're right. Again, there are business decisions involved in what we were going to do. And you knew we only have four days. And in those four days, there's only two days of interviews who are the most important people to interview. Who can we get? Um, and what are the questions? What's the information we need to get from them? Now, from my perspective, having you on this project has been huge for me. Uh, for the Girl Who Wore Freedom, I did all of that work myself, came up with the questions myself, and wasn't super organized in my thought process. I was really following more what the, you know, more what people were giving me. And I would just kind of div dig deeper into their stories. This was a little different in that we know what we need them to tell us in order to make the story that we want to make. And so you did come up with questions for all of our seven interviewees. You gave them to me in advance. Um, and the thing that was the most helpful is that you were listening. You were there. I mean, writers oftentimes maybe don't come to the set, particularly of a documentary, but to have you there, um, I was working on my phone and you would send me notes, you know, okay, we've had enough about this. We, I really need you to talk to him about this. Um, and for me, you giving me that kind of direction was amazing. Yeah, no, I think it was a great system we had. And I think there's a, there's a fine line and a bit of a, you know, responsibility that you have as someone who's for both of us, you know, as we're shaping and molding the story because we don't want to, you know, shape it too much and make it force it into something that it's not or, or give like our side or a one-sided opinion of something, you know, you really want, you know, the story to present itself, but you also don't want it to be too chaotic and you just want to kind of guide it along. And so I think that's what was worked so well is, you know, we had, broad questions where we could you know contain it to a certain amount you know there's i mean certain people we interviewed they could talk for you know 15 <laughs> hours about any what you know anything so you have to you know contain them and lead them down the right direction but also 
having these open-ended questions where they could kind of lead us along the same way that we were leading them. You know, it was, it was a great process and that way you could be completely engaged in the interview and be able to, you know, talk to them and get into more of that like emotional aspect while I was, you know, behind the scenes listening and then being able to tell you, hey, let's go ahead and move this way or, oh, they just said that, let's, let's build on top of that. That's a great point. That's something I didn't even think of because that was the thing. There's all sorts of things that you can never prepare for. Um, and someone does, you know, a statement and it completely shifts everything. And so that's what I think was great about it is we were both able to work together, work with the interviewee and kind of create this story without any distractions on that yeah. level. Yeah, it was beautiful in my opinion. So talk to me about how this compares to what you learned in film school. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it's definitely very, very different. I think everyone's film school is completely different depending on where you go and what you do, what you focus on. Even at Auburn, there were two kind of paths you could go on. Um, I did more like film theory um, side of things and the writing side of things. So I spent a lot of time watching movies, discussing movies, understanding, you know, structure and, and then, you know, writing classes. I took a few hands-on classes to familiarize myself with the camera and editing and little things like that. But that nothing can compare to being, you know, thrown in and having to do the real deal and, and how, I mean, being on a film set, things change constantly. There's a lot of, you know, problem solving. Everyone has to be able to do their job. It's like, you know, it's like a sports team or anything like that. Everyone kind of has to be clicking um, a well-oiled machine. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a great experience actually being on set. This is the first, I've been on some smaller sets before, but this is the first time that I was able to, you know, have a real role and um, really be involved. And it was, a, it was a great experience that, uh, you know, I, I think that film school prepared me for it to a certain degree, but I also think that it's hard to compare to the, the real thing. So do you think, I mean, like I said before, we didn't have our writer on set when we were filming the first time for The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Um, you know, have you, did you expect to be on set? Do you feel like it was helpful that you were there? Did you learn things while you were there? That's three different questions but maybe you can weave them all together you're a writer you can do it yeah no I think it was 100% a great experience for me I mean as someone who is very you know young still and getting you know my first real involvement into the field I think that it was just great to anytime I can be on set I, I love it um, and you know I do have aspirations to eventually direct and so like that to being able to watch you especially the reenactment days was I mean, just awesome. But I think from, you know, strictly writing aspect, I think it was great for the interview questions to be there and really be able to have my say about like, oh, I, you know, I've been working on this, I had this idea, being able to have that say still and have that power, which sometimes a writer's power gets taken away the second they send off, you know, the questions or the script or whatever it is. So, you know, being able to still have a collaborative process with you is, is you know, awesome. And then I'll, I think just, and this is what you told me from the beginning when you told me you wanted me to come, was being there, being in Normandy, seeing the sites, meeting the veterans, meeting the people who live there, all that stuff is you can't read it on a screen, read it on a page, and feel the way it feels to actually be there. And that's what was the, the best part of it was, you know, I mean, all the ideas and words just start flowing out of you once you get there and you have that experience because you can't recreate it. I totally agree with you. I mean, that's why I was so adamant that you come because I'm writing and reading about Hell's Corner and the battle at Hell's Corner is one thing. And you think you understand it and you can watch it in a video game or you can watch it on a movie. Um, but I mean, actually standing where the battle happened, being in the fields where the men sacrificed their lives there is a power there and it gives you a completely different understanding. I mean, yeah, I totally agree with you. Don't you feel like you just yeah. have this rich base to build from now as you think about the stories? Yeah. And I think it, it adds a level of like, you don't want to be disingenuous about it, about anything that you're doing, especially when it comes to this kind of thing. So I feel like before in my mind, it was like trying to recreate the story um, in a certain way. Uh, the battle and just the town and now it feels like I just want to recreate the feelings that I had when I was there 
And so I think that's a very different thing. And I, cause you can't recreate it. You can't recreate what it's like to be there. Although in a way that's what we're trying to do is give people the feelings that we had when we were there. And obviously we want people to go and experience it on their own, but you can't, unless you live there, you can't be there every day. And so I think that's really what I took away from it was being able to understand that I want to convey the feeling that I had being there and not just, you know, just the history of it a lot. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is that it, what you're saying reminds me of what Jeff Kurtenacker said about the score for the girl who wore freedom. You know, he wants to know the emotion that we want to convey in the film, not necessarily the specific notes or instruments or anything like that. He just wanted me to give him the feelings. And he went to Normandy to feel and experience what it was like to be there because it colored the way that he was going to create this music. And I think um, what you're saying is being in that place made me feel things. I feel things. Now I care more about this story. And it may not you know, it may be an intangible way that it influences your writing, but I think having that passion and those feelings behind your writing comes through on the screen, I think, and on the page. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just don't see a way where it doesn't change the way that I, you know, I mean, it's just such a, I mean, it's, it really is. I mean, that was my first time you know, being in Normandy and getting to be there, you know, on the anniversary, going to Utah Beach, 630 in the morning, when the soldiers stormed the beach. I mean, it's just, it is an emotional experience and, and you know, once in a lifetime. Um, and I just, there, I don't see a way where it doesn't impact or change the way yeah. that, you know, I, I write about it. I can't wait to take you to the Netherlands. <laughs> yes, yes, that'll be our gonna, next trip. Gonna be awesome. Yeah, you know, I wonder too, you know, we're going to be upfront about this. You, you're not really getting paid for this job. This is a lot of sweat equity, not just you, everyone. Um, right. Everyone paid for their own flights. Uh, they took off time from work. Uh, and it really was just a team effort to kind of get this project started. I mean, I'm guessing that you're feeling like that's worth it. I mean, would you recommend people to do that kind of volunteer work and take on? I mean, you even took on some of the financial burden to make this happen. Retrospectively, do you think that was a good idea? Yeah, I do. I think, I mean, you know, everyone's different and everyone has their own circumstances and, you know, opportunities. But I think, you know, there's a very hard industry uh, to get into. And so, although, you know, technically, you know, I'm, I'm not getting paid or anything like that it is, you know, you're giving me an opportunity, um, that not a lot of people at my age with, you know, I'm building experience. And I think that that is worth, uh, the, the price of a flight out there and all that stuff. So I think that it's, you know, it is not a traditional aspect, um, but it is to me worth it. And, uh, it's a great opportunity and I'm, I've learned a tremendous amount so far and I hope to continue to do that. And, you know, it's something that I'm interested in and passionate about now. Um, and that's how I'm choosing to, you know, spend my time. And that's, I'm, I'm very happy with those choices. Yeah. I would actually say the same thing. I have not been paid really once for anything that I've done, whether it's girly or freedom or this, um, I really am learning as well. For me, it's been like a graduate degree in filmmaking, you know, um, and I feel like that has been valuable uh, because just um, even though I'm not financially profiting from what I'm doing, um, I feel like I'm learning and growing and making the world better by the stories that I tell and um, and you're right. You will have an amazing recommendation from me um, and, and you will walk away with experience. And I hope you're going to walk away with one or two films or a series under your belt. Um, you've certainly proved you're capable of of handling that. And I, I really hope we can kind of grow these two projects together. I've enjoyed working with you. Um, let's change the um, direction a little bit and let's talk about uh, you've you've alluded to it specifically what you did. Um, you know, 
your experience of flying over to Normandy, uh, what you did when you got there, what it was like uh, for you to be there for your first time in France, not knowing the language. Uh, let's just talk about that experience, uh, just being there. Yeah, no, I mean, it was, so I've, I have been to Europe before. It's been a little bit of time there, but I, like you said, you know, hadn't been to France and I feel like I did not know what to expect or kind of, it was kind of a blind uh, leap of faith going over there. I didn't know what to expect. And although my bags did not originally make it, I was able to get them on the way back. It was a different story. I had the worst bag luck of anyone yeah. I've ever heard of. You sure wow. did. And I think it's crazy. Nobody else had their bags. No one else lost no one else. but Just you me, had, had lost been. there and back and back yes that's correct I've never heard of that before but besides that you know I it was it was just you know you didn't I mean Rick our production unit director he picked me up from the airport had never really talked to him before didn't know what to expect I'm like on the phone so I'm like I can't find my bag and I think that kind of just was a great way to just dive you know right in and off the bat everyone uh in the crew clicked super well so that was like not a problem at all um, but yeah, I, I didn't know what to expect. And I, like I said, I'd done the Europe thing kind of, but it was very like study abroad, touristy, like, you know, when you, as an American, especially a young American, I think you think of like, oh, like Europe, you know, it's a Eiffel Tower and going to see Queen Elizabeth and, you know, drinking espressos and little patios and things like that. And Normandy is different, you know, it's like going to like this. I mean, I grew up in the South, still live in the South in the u.s and it's kind of i mean it's that farm that agriculture that i tell so, everybody you know, that yeah we leave we leave paris and we're just in a van driving out and all of a sudden i'm like this looks like i'm back in south georgia like yep. what you know it, you got this beautiful sunset and all these fields and farms and so i think there was a little bit that i kind of felt at home like right away it wasn't too much of a culture suck besides the speaking zero french and i probably know less now that I went, I feel, I feel, I was like, oh, I might be able to know a little bit. And they started talking and I was like, I don't know anything, <laughs> but uh, we were able to make it. And, you know, we had some great French people on our crew too, that were able to translate for us and things like that. But no, it was, uh, it was an experience that I like, I mean, I, it's hard to even put into words sometimes. I got, I get back, I'm talking to my family and stuff. I'm like, I don't even know where to begin, but it was, it was awesome. We got in and right. I mean, it was go, go, go the entire time we were there. I mean, we, we did, as, we definitely didn't waste any time while we were there. I don't there. remember we were, um, when you landed. So you landed, you drove four hours to Normandy. Well, we went and did the camera check first. We spent like four hours in Paris doing a full. Talk to me about check. that. So you got off the plane, you picked up Mindy, you, Rick Arbazani and Mindy, drove to a, a rental house in Paris. Yep. Talk to me about yeah. what happened when you got there. <laughs> so, yeah. So we go to the rental house in Paris and they, you know, we go inside, they take us up to basically where all the equipment is. And Mindy was the one that, I mean, that, that's her bread and butter there. So she started kind of going through all the equipment and stuff, but it was, I mean, this is a legit Paris, you know, equipment house. So it's pretty cool. Cause they got all the posters of every famous movie that they've ever done there. And being the film nerd that I am, I'm like, oh my God, did they use the equipment for this and that. I was freaking out. Uh, and I was like, oh wait, I'm one of those people now. I got to act like I, I've been there before, you know? Right, so exactly. I was, uh, yeah, yeah. No, but uh, they were super nice. Many did the check. And then we, Rick and I had to go get the big production van. So we walked like two miles through the Paris streets and went to like this. We, we, we couldn't figure out where we were going. Went down this back alley, ended up on like a soccer field. <laughs> and then finally we make it out. And uh, we find the van and Rick and I both don't speak any French, like I said. And so we're trying to communicate with this guy. He speaks zero English. Finally, we figured it out. We get the van. We go back. We, you know, loaded up the equipment. Then we drove the four hours in. So we didn't even get in that night until 1130 midnight. And I'd been up since the day before because of, you know, the right. and everything. Yeah. Right. So it, it was a long day. And so I was ready to go to bed. And then it was up and at it 7 30 the next morning to come pick up you from the uh, when you were flying in right so. that's right you landed on june 1st i came in on june 2nd and so 
you guys had never met before. You and Rick and Mindy never met before, never been in Paris, hadn't driven around there, didn't speak the language. I love your chutzpah and, you know, being willing to do that. Uh, that's, that's a huge thing that you guys all accomplished together. And by the time I met you, you felt, it felt like to me, you guys have been around each other forever. So it sounds like that experience was a real bonding experience, kind of getting through that together. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, Mindy and I spent time talking on zoom and stuff like that, but we had never met. And so we had, you know, right away went through all that. We had a four hour drive together. So, you know, learned, uh, learned how to get along well. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was, uh, it was, a, that's how it was with everyone though. You know, it, everyone would kind of get added to the group or we, you know, it just kind of, you get thrown in and something would happen and you, it was a bonding experience. You that's know, true. Where it was I remember, I or... love the story where you talked about when you first met Rick on Zoom and like you had no idea, talk, talk about that. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, Rick's just uh, uh intimidating man of stature. He's, you know, big, tall guy with a beard. And, you know, he just looked real grumpy. And I was like, who is this guy? And he's picking me up from the airport. And I'd never met him before or anything like that. And I texted him. And, you know, anyone over, like, the age of, like, 35, when you text them, they did, like, they did, you know, the periods. And you're, like, a little intimidated. You're like, I don't, do they, you can't tell if they, like, so, you know, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. So. I'm texting with him and he's just like, okay, period. I'm like, why does it sound like he's excited to pick me up? And so, yeah, fine. And then I lost my bag. So I'm running late and he's like, oh, well, I'm, I'm waiting for you. I'm like, God, this guy's going to hate me. And then, you know, right off the bat, he's the nicest guy ever. And he's drinking this Coke Zeros like he always is. And, uh, you know, we ended up getting along super well. He's a, he's a great guy. But it's just, that's how it was with everyone. You know, they just get thrown in and you're like, yeah. let's hope this person it's cool with everything and everyone was, everyone was great. So, yeah. Well, so you get out to Normandy and we're staying in this big manoir out in the middle of nowhere in a town called Frayville. Uh, and you're stumbling in at 11 o'clock at night and, uh, got to find where you're sleeping and, uh, it's kind of a mess. And then the next morning, what you guys had to wake up and get all that equipment and what, what happened next? Yeah, so we, me, Rick, and Mindy woke up early the next morning, headed out to uh, the airport where you were flying into with all the veterans with Delta and Michelin. Um, and Mindy brought a camera. She was like, hey, you're doing sound today. I was like, sounds great. She was like, you know, like, what to do? And I was like, ah, yeah, I learned to like, I mean, I know how to run a boom mic from film school. It was like a class, a day in a class. And I was like, I think I remember enough. And so... She was man in the camera and kind of just went around and shot some B-roll footage, got a, got a few interviews in real quick, and I was on the boom. And, yeah, it was just kind of running and gunning and, you know, right from, you know, woke up next morning, six hours of sleep, and we're just already running and gunning, doing something completely un I was unprepared for. Uh, <laughs> but, no, it was, it was a good time. That was a great day. Um, we got some cool stuff there. You were able to join us at that point. Yeah, I mean, I flew in. In the meantime, I was flying from Atlanta, Georgia to uh, Deauville and with the 29 veterans, Danny and her daughter, Flo. And we arrived there to this, you know, big ta-da and uh, to-do. And we found you guys right away. And so then we kind of went through that experience of, of meeting different people, interviewing different people, sitting down and there being a ceremony. Uh, we entered a Wally, a veteran um, Air Force guy afterwards. That was my favorite. Um, my son, Jonah Taylor, and his uh, girlfriend, Donna, also showed up uh, during that time. So that was sort of the next editions of the crew. And you know, we were off to the races because after that, uh, we then went to Carantan and we had the screening of the Girl Who Wore Freedom. And I think you guys, I don't know, did you guys go back to the memoir or what were y'all doing? I think, I think that was, that day was the day I caught up on my sleep. Because okay. I had, like we had, yeah. So I think I, I went back, caught up on some sleep and then, cause we were back at it early the next morning we had a I think the next day was the day of the, uh, like we did the Cabbage Patch ceremony. We did. Yeah, Angleville and the Cabbage Patch yep. and Michelin dinner with all the veterans. And that's when Chad and Taylor joined us. Yes, and then Chad and, and Taylor so. joined us. Chad is our DP or and Taylor was our producer. So they showed up, two more people to the team. 
Yep, and they were added in, and we went to the the Michelin dinner, and I think that was a good kind of. Now that we had the like main, it felt like we had the main. You know, we had the team there kind of, and it kind of felt like a good. We had the dinner, and it was a good bonding experience for us all to sit down, have a great meal. I mean, was, Michelin knows what they're doing when it comes to food. I'll tell you that much. But uh, it was uh, it was great for us to sit down, have a meal, kind of everyone really get to know each other. Yet again great group of people everyone clicked right off the bat um and yeah and so then from there it was kind of just we all were in it together and everyone and we was, had you know we had some d-day events so you know yeah. on the, on the fourth fifth and sixth it was a lot of d-day events and some doing some scouting of the locations um where we were going to be shooting while i had to do other events you guys went and did that um yeah. and then uh we woke i, I i'll never forget this feeling of at the end of the day on the sixth, putting the girl who wore freedom activities to bed and turning toward a late night production meeting, you know, pre-production meeting for everything we were going to do the next four days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was kind of, you know, it was, it was officially the, the moving on. I, I was, when I get back, you know, people were kind of asking me about the trip and how to go. And I said, yeah, you know, the first half was great. It was a lot of of you know actually experiencing the d-day thing like experience and you know uh, immersing ourselves in that and it was a lot of kissing hands or shaking hands and kissing babies for the girl who wore freedom you know it was a lot of and we you've made some great connections there and we're grateful for everyone and everyone's so great and it was an awesome experience but you know it's part of it and we you know you had to do all that we were along for the ride and we had the film festivals and the screenings and all that stuff and then officially the, the night of the six, it was like, all right, we're moving on. And it was a, it was a passing of the torch moment for sure. Yeah. And I was just so ready to turn my focus toward this Carenton dock and sink into this new team. And uh, that production meeting just really was inspiring because the team had come together. Everybody knew what their roles were. We were just figuring out some basic details. We were all ready to film the next morning. And so we filmed seven, eight, nine, ten. Seventh was interviews, 10th was interviews, and eight, nine were the two reenactment days. Um, and I would say your roles changed on, you know, I think you had similar roles on seven and 10, different roles on eight and nine. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, on the interview days, I was, you know, with the laptop, with the questions, kind of relaying to you um, the different questions, prepping you for the interviews talking to the interviewees before the interviews, making sure, you know, they're comfortable with everything. So it was definitely more like the true, like, writer, like, approach to it um, that I've been preparing for. And then on the reenactment days, you know, it wasn't as much, like, I, I, I helped in a little bit of ways from my perspective beforehand with the pre-production. But once we were there, you know, it was pretty much all mapped out. And so we just had to kind of shoot it. And so I was more in a observant role kind of the first day especially kind of watching you watching chad um and mindy on the cameras and just trying to absorb as much information as i could learn as much and then when i knew something or had an idea being able to input my voice and be like hey let's try this or let's do that or i you know i remembered this um and you know by the second day of reenactment shootings i felt very comfortable we had a good um, routine down and communication stuff like that you even allowed me to uh, direct two little scenes um, uh, that were was a great experience super exciting um, I uh, I was honored to have the opportunity I think they went well um, and then yeah I mean it was just it was it was awesome I was, you know doing everything I was you know just helping in any way I could and trying to absorb as much information as I could. I loved seeing that. I loved uh, seeing how versatile you were in that space. And, you know, like I said, not only did you write up the questions, did you collaborate with me? Were you giving me notes while I was doing the interview? You were also taking notes. Um, you were listening, actively listening to what was happening, taking notes about the answers. Um, and so you were very busy during those interview days. Um, oh, yeah. And it was super great. But I also loved how you did jump in and say, hey, I remember this thing. Let's do this. I also loved how you picked up a, uh, a slingshot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, we had the uh, the special effects unit. Uh, I was I was leading that with uh, Chad had brought over these like dust paintballs basically, and with these slingshots, and so you know recreated the bullet fire on the helmets and on the posts. That was a lot of fun to to get through that. Like I said, you know, any 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 way I could uh, I could help. So yeah, mm. so so that was great. Um, you know, just to have you kind of involved in in that in any way you could and loved seeing it loved seeing you get that experience loved your input your creative ideas um you know loved the opportunity to collaborate with you and how ready you were um that's another thing i've learned about you is just your spirit of venture to to be like whatever it is i'm here to help um and the other thing i learned that i did not know in all of our zoom meetings of the last 18 months is how funny you were uh, I think you brought a great, great sense of humor to the crew and uh, just, it was fantastic. I loved it. You were fully yourself yeah. and we got to see all of Zach Callahan, who now really is named Cal, we know. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Well. It's uh, made it to the nickname level. So <laughs> That's yeah. true. Yeah. So, I mean, is there anything else if you're talking to young writers um, who might be listening to this or who want to go into screenwriting, you know, I, I want to know what you would say to them. That's question number one. Question number two, out of this collaboration and talking with Chad, our DP, um, we really started talking about, you know, somebody had mentioned to me long ago about looking at the Brave Dutch as a narrative, bringing Chad in and wants to do narrative work, you who want to do narrative screenwriting. Now we're talking about something totally different because we're assembling pieces of the pro of the of what it would take to do that. Um, and so now that's a possibility. Um, so that I love. Uh, but back to the question is, you know, young people interested in going into screenwriting and the film industry, what would your advice be? Yeah, I mean, I would the first thing I would say is like you, I mean, you have to you have to write, you have to do it. Um, because that's the only way you're gonna become better in my opinion is the the three things that you can do is you actually have to write you have to read other people's screenplays and then you just have to watch as many movies documentaries whatever it is stories you, know, you just got to read it and watch it and then you actually have to do it is, is the main thing but I also think that like there's a natural instinct to people who are drawn to the writing aspect that is safe at least this is something that I feel is like you're kind of you know, you're hiding behind the screen. I feel like people who are behind the camera, they feel that way as well about, they don't want to be in front of the camera. You know, there's this, there's something protecting them, you know, vulnerability to it. But yeah, I feel like you can always just stay at home and write. And sometimes you just got to actually, you know, share your writing, go out there in the world. And I think that's what was a great experience for me was, you know, I've spent all this time writing and stuff, but it's, you know, it's hard to have, you know, people who have actual say, Say, whatever that means to you know to read your whatever you've written your screenplay or whatever and so I think this was a great opportunity for me to actually you know prove to myself in a way that like okay you're actually you know what you're doing you're good at this you, I was out there a part of it on set every day um, putting that knowledge to the test and I think that that was a great experience and I you know that's what I would say is just you have to do it you have to you know whatever your fear or you know, because that's the thing is you're sitting there in front of a blank page every day going, well, what am I, this is terrible. You know, it, it's a battle against yourself half the time. I mean, ever I have a bunch of friends I went to school with that, you know, were interested in writing as well. And they're still doing it, a lot of them. And they say the same thing, you know, it's a battle. Half of it's just a battle against yourself. And so you just got to get over that and go out there and, and do it. And it's easier said than done. But this experience definitely has given me a new level of confidence. Um about my abilities. Uh, and I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things I'll take away from it. Yeah. Great advice. Absolutely great advice. And I do think that the other thing I saw happen is I saw you do a lot of research. I don't know if a lot of writers understand how much research is involved in being able to write something, but I saw you yeah, do a lot. Gotta, yeah. Gotta be prepared. You know, I mean, that's how I feel about it is just, preparation is very important um and as much as you know you have to fly by the seat of your pants at times because it's always changing uh that's going to be a lot easier if you're prepared and uh and that's what you know 
being prepared, being able, being flexible. I think those are two big things. Um, and you can't really be flexible if you're not prepared. So, yeah. Another thing I saw happen is I saw you make connections, industry connections. I think that's another yeah. great thing about just being on set uh, and, and being willing to say yes, like you did. Uh, it, you and um, Chad seem to get along really well. Yeah, yeah, uh, got along great. Yeah. I could see you guys collaborating in the future. So it's always good to, to make that connection. You also made a connection with one of our crew members, Grace Rapp. Uh, which was insane. Why don't you tell us about that story? Yeah, no. Well, we just found out through conversation. She was uh, on set helping us out. And through conversation, we realized that we had met pretty much like five years ago to the day almost uh, on spring break in 2017. <laughs> uh, completely super random. She had like a video on her phone and I was like in the background of it and all this stuff. So that was just, I mean, that was wild. I, I, Still can't really believe that. Yeah, I still can't believe that either because it's so random that Grace even ended up on our crew. Um, Grace yeah. Rapp is a soccer player over in Europe. She plays for women's soccer. Um, she's been on the France team in uh, France. She's now moving back to England. She's from England. We're going to have her on the podcast because she su was such a great addition. So much fun. Um, she was really there to try to find out, uh, was she going to continue to pursue her soccer a career or was she going to go back to she had been in film school as well and interested in cinematography and was she going to go that way so um yeah crazy connection uh yeah, super wow. fun small and, world right you know super small <laughs> world yeah well i mean this has been amazing um i look forward to talking to you more as we get deeper into the to writing aspect of things thank you cool. for everything that you have done for documentary first and in the past and i know how much more you have to do in the future we're so happy to have you a part of this project i've loved working with you and i can't wait to do more yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to be here and I'll I'm happy to join the podcast anytime and I I, I love talking about these things. So awesome. Uh well I just realized we have yet to do our favorite segment, which is DocuView Deja Vu. DocuView yes. Deja Vu. All right. So now we're into our favorite segment, uh DocuView Deja Vu. Why don't you tell us if you've come prepared with your favorite documentary? I have. I'm gonna do I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna do two. Okay. Because I, I have one that's like this year that just came out that I just saw that blew me away, hmm. which is uh, Navalny. It is about Alexei Navalny, who is a political figure from Russia who ran against Putin in like a couple years ago in the last election. And in 2020, August of 2020, there was an assassination attempt against him. And this documentary follows like post assassination attempts, like kind of with during the assassination attempts with like all the news stories and then post that uh, interviews with him and then kind of like his journey going back to Russia. And it is absolutely insane. It is like a Russian spy novel, but like real. And there's one of the most insane scenes I've ever seen in my life where he basically confronts the people who tried to assassinate him. That's not a spoiler or anything. That's what it's about. But it is absolutely wild. I saw it like last week for the first time. It just came out. Uh, it's on HBO Max. Could not recommend it enough. Truly wild. Oh, can't wait um, to watch it. Yeah, it, it was. It's really, really good. It's also like a story that's still going on. It definitely plays into, you know, with everything going on with Russia and Ukraine. And I, you know, it ties in, but could not recommend that enough. Super cool. Um, and then... My favorite documentary of all time, I'm sure you heard me and Chad uh, talk about this when uh, I when we were in Normandy, but Minding the Gap, I have it. I, I'm a big physical media guy, so I brought it. I have it right here. Um, <laughs> it is my favorite documentary, if not one of my favorite films of all time. It's about three friends uh, in Rockford, Illinois, so not, not too far from you. Uh, growing up, it kind of follows them. So Bing is one of the characters in it, and he is the guy who directed it and then also as a cinematographer on it. And he started some of the filming when he was like 13, like they're young, they're in middle school. It follows them all the way into their young adult lives. And it tackles kind of everything from family life um, to drug addiction, alcoholism, uh, domestic violence, kind of it really just like, 
anything and everything that can go wrong in life and kind of ties them together with their friendship and skateboarding is kind of what brought them together as friends. And then, you know, they kind of fall apart as the year go, years go on, but it's, it's really just an incredible story about life and kind of, you know, this Midwestern story of, of a part of the country that kind of seems to get forgotten about a lot, a type of people, you know, working class people that get forgotten about. And um, it's just an incredible uh, film, incredible story. I love it. I've, I've watched it a number of times. It, I, it came out in 2018. I remember the first time I saw it, I, I was like completely blown away by it. I recommend it to anybody, even if you're not into skateboarding or documentaries. It's it's truly, uh, it's truly an incredible film. That's awesome. Yeah, Chad came out wearing a Minding the Gap sweatshirt. What, what yeah, did you say yeah. when you saw that? Well, I, I was like, oh my God, like, you, like you're a fan too. But I guess like he, you know, he went to DePaul and uh being also went to the ball and so they crossed paths and they kind of uh know each other on a lot on a on a certain level and so uh he had gotten the shirt from him and i was just like oh my god i'm so jealous because i i i love 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 the the documentary and so he was like yeah no like it's great and so we that was one of the first things that we bonded over was yeah, our love for it that's so. super cool okay yeah. well i'm going to talk about a new one that i just watched i actually watched it uh on the plane home from france uh and it's called brian wilson um long promised road and this is a story that was done by brent wilson um who is no not related at all to Brian. And Brian Wilson, as many of you know, is um, sort of one of the Beach Boys. He is one of the Beach Boys. Uh, and this documentary looks at sort of his life and contribution to the Beach Boys. And I was blown away by how this documentary was done. It was incredibly engrossing, uh, but it was complicated by the fact that Brian Wilson does have some mental illness based on, you know, his own genetic makeup, but probably impacted by, you know, his years of drug use and things like that. I, they don't go into the whole story, but but you can tell there are issues impacting him. And so he is too afraid and too scared. He's like a little child inside to sit down and do a, a, a regular interview. And so they had to figure out a way to get him to be able to talk about his story. And the way that they did that was so brilliant. Um, it does not follow any filmmaking um, you know, guidelines really, other than talking with your subject in a way that draws them out and allows them to be truly themselves. Uh, so it's a great story. It's a sad story. It's a warm story. Uh, you can find it on Amazon Prime. It is a, a great documentary by a great documentary filmmaker. Um, Brent Wilson just has a, a an amazing history of being able to tell stories really well. So highly recommend it. Brian Wilson, Long Promised Road. Yeah. There you go. All right. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody. <laughs>